the actual chat will be uh, will be lovely. Right, we are. We should be live. I reckon. I reckon so. Um, so I'm just going to give it a few minutes to allow people to join. Welcome to everyone who is joining this particular call. It is great to see you. So this is the Ask Me Anything with the glorious Michelle Corrigan um, from Better Security, Better Care. So we're talking all things digital security, um, specifically, I think, within the sort of like social care, care, care business um, realm. So um, it should be a really, really good chat. We've had uh, lots of questions that have come through before the call, which we're going to be answering on this. Um, and if you have any additional questions at all, or if you just want to say hi, um, then please do use the chat, which is uh, at the bottom of the screen there. I can see hello from Ireland, Sean Webb, and hello, Hannah. Um, welcome. If anyone wants to introduce themselves and say hi, I'm going to do a sort of awkward which I've already warned Michelle about awkward preamble <laughs> for the next sort of two minutes while we wait for, for people to, to join us. Um, so welcome everyone who is joining. Um, hello, Nathan. Hi from Devon. Oh, we're really, we're really crossing the whole country. Where where are you uh, where are you calling in from actually, Michelle? So I'm in the Wirral. Ah. Which the minute I speak, everyone is gonna know I'm Merseyside. I'm in Crosby right now. Oh, are you? Yeah. I'll just, I'll just maybe get up on the roof and wave. <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to see you across the river. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's grab a let's grab a, a beer after this. Um. Yeah. So so um. Yeah. Welcome everyone who is who is joining. Um. So this is the digital security. Ask me anything. So, um. I'm just gonna ramble for one more minute to make sure we've given everyone a chance to, to log in. Um, so this is digital security, all things digital security. What What is it? <laughs> Why is it important? Um, and sort of what are some best practices that you as a business can do, whether you're implementing sort of home care technology or training your team up or that kind of thing. This is all of the digital security questions that have been um, submitted beforehand. Um, and if you do have a question that springs to mind uh, while we're while we're on the live, then um, we may we may be able to get to it. But with all of these flock ask me anything, then keep up to date with the calendar because you get a chance to submit questions to these amazing experts um, but beforehand. Um, so the things that you need to know you can find out exactly, and, and that's what we're here about. So I think with no further ado, uh, we will kick off. Um, so just in case for anyone who uh, is uh, has to drop out at any point or kind of like joins a bit late, everything uh, will be shared into the resource library on Flock. So including the recording of this uh, of this fabulous Ask Me Anything, um, we'll also follow up with um, with any materials or recordings afterwards as well. So it means that, you know, you don't need to worry about your internet dropping out, which uh, for me is a pressing concern. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, I hope you're ready to sort of like, just in case sort of- um, I, I can, I can ad lib, I can improv, it's gonna be fine. Perfect. We're just gonna we're just gonna ramp. Uh, ramp. <laughs> Great. So to to kick us off, I'd actually I would actually love to just get a understanding of sort of who you are um, and you know who, who do you work for and sort of why digital security. Of course. So I'm the program director for Better Security, Better Care, which is the Department of Health and Social Care's adult social care program for cyber resilience particularly, how you get prepared and how you make sure your organisation is ready. We are based at the Digital Care Hub, who, is, who are the organisation who just take care of everything digital for adult social care. Advice, information, guidance, we run webinars, we host special interest groups. We are just really interested primarily in how you leverage data technology safely to improve care. Now, I'm not a tech person. I've been doing this role now since 2021. And I'll be really honest, I've been in adult social care in one form or another since 2010. And when I started this job, some of my passwords were my name. So I came at this really from the same place as everybody else in social care. In a, what is it? Why are we doing it? And over the past three years, I'm now an evangelist. Like, come join my cult of data and cybersecurity. Because it's 
so important. And the thing that, before I answer any questions, before I talk about anything else, the world of tech and data is exciting and interesting. Do this bit first because it's really hard to do later. And the most important parts, and I'll talk about it all through this hour, are your people. It isn't the tech. The thing that you can really focus on to make a real tangible difference is your people. So yeah, that's where I am and that's where I'm coming from. I think that's that's great. And and I'm sure we will all have joined your cult. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so for you mentioned sort of like coming from that, that non-techie uh background stuff. So I, I think what's amazing is sort of within um home care, which is kind of the market flock and 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 birdie sort of work within mainly but any kind of living complex domiciliary care all of that you get a full range of people who are kind of like i know everything about tech i i invented the internet sort mm. of thing all the way through to kind of a biro is the most uncomfortable <laughs> with <laughs> so to kind of to to kind of help meet everyone in the middle for for non tech experts can you explain sort of basically what cybersecurity is and why it's so important to factor it into your business. Okay. Well, for that audience, I start even earlier. Let's start with why data is important to be kept secure. So every bit of information about you is yours. And, you know, you know that the, the story of who you are, the building the picture of who you are, is all rooted in the data of the facts of who you are. Now, think about where you want that to go and how you want other people to look after it. And that's really where we start with social care. We hold so much data about the individuals that we support. And that data varies from, you know, what feels like very benign right up to the most sensitive data about a human being. And all of that, we are the stewards are of while we provide them care. So we have to keep it safe. We've got a legal obligation, really important. And we've got, you know, a moral and ethical obligation. None of us are in social care because we don't care. Now, as we go into a more digital world and we host more of this stuff, you know, it's no longer on a piece of paper in a locked drawer, it's on a laptop. It's on a laptop, it's probably backed up on the cloud. If we're dealing with systems, we're probably sending it to another organisation at some point. If we're working with our NHS partners or other organisations who deliver care, we're probably talking to them. All of that data as it moves, we've got to keep that safe. So if you think about it in a really physical sense, if you had a filing cabinet and you were moving it from one office to another you're not taking it on the bus with the drawers unlocked we shouldn't be doing it when we are moving information between systems so that's why it's important it's as important as all the other ways we keep people safe and secure i think that that's that's a really that's a really clear description because i think for for so many people there's this idea of kind of like well i understand security in terms of like locking away a paper record in a filing cabinet and having and holding the key mm -hmm. but it's exactly the same <laughs> online you need to make sure it's locked away and you have the key um on there but that obviously then i think when people know it's online it it just it feels more complex especially um, when we talk about things like the cloud for example yeah. so the, cl the cloud isn't a cloud is news to some people it's just the exact same server that 10 years ago you would have had in your premises now you're just using someone else's. That means that you're sending that information somewhere else. Where you send it and how you send it's important. Nice. Yeah, ab absolutely. Well, I think um, that that feels like a very good place to, to start. That we've got this understanding of it's about the data. It's about making sure it's kind of secure. I I had a question which, which came, which I think is really interesting. Um, and again, maybe speaks to... to um, for, for people on the call, we'll kind of move to the more sort of questions, um, more high level expert level ones towards the end. But just to start and give us this grounding here, um, a question is, what are the most common types of cyber attacks that target um, domiciliary care agencies? Can you talk a bit about that cyber attack? How do they get your data? Absolutely. So the ones actually that are the most common are the ones that we know in everyday life. So phishing scams, which is where someone sends you an email and pretending to be someone else or asking you to, to take an action usually. So it's open this file, it's click on this link, it's 
follow this. It's fill out your account details to go forward. They're becoming more and more sophisticated. The days of the Nigerian prince asking you for £5,000 so that he can give you a million are long gone. Now it's an email that looks very much like your bank emailing you. And as an organisation, you're just as vulnerable to those as you are as an individual kind of in person. Um, the other is something called social engineering. So where you might get an email from your CEO saying, can you click on this link and attend this meeting? But actually, when you look at their email address, it's one letter different or the full stop is in a different place. So it's created to look like an email from your internal system or from very formally from the NHS or from a partner you know, but it isn't them. It's kind of socially engineered to look like it and you follow through. Those are the ones that are really risky. The other cyber attack, the one that is keeps me awake at night, is in the systems that you use, what happens when one of those is cyber attack? So it's not your system. It's not the thing that you log into every day. But it might be your care plan and it might be your roster and it might be your catering ordering system. What happens when they go down? So they may have something called ransomware, for example. So a small domiciliary care provider, it's, un it's relatively unlikely, not impossible, that you will be the victim of a ransomware attack because the ransom they could charge you is, is relatively low. But a large software supplier is much more at risk of that. And they were the kind of things that could impact you and your service. Absolutely. So that, that's why it's, it's um, this is one of the questions we'll come on to later in terms of what you should be looking for in any software provider that you bring in. And it's interesting that it, it's not even necessarily the ones which feel obvious, like the care management software and stuff like that. It can be like, well, who do you use for your... <laughs> For your, for your catering bits or, or kind of like where, where you order your PPE equipment from or that kind of thing. Like it, it, any any sort of software that you use, you need to be confident that they have a real handle on sort of like the security thing. So you don't need to, you at least don't need to worry about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I can imagine. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a really, that's a really good point. And that, that's, that's kind of that, software piece as it will come on to later but you mentioned at the beginning that actually like making sure that your team is <laughs> making sure your team is aware uh is is so important so this this question uh came in which was um how can we make sure our remote workers and caregivers are following best practices for cyber security so is it training is it regular updates is that you know it's all the things you do to manage your staff in anything. Like, how do we get our staff to do what we need them to do? Now, there's a little bit of a, a cultural battle we fight when we come to cyber because we're not cyber people and we see it as something that isn't our responsibility. So it's really hard to then talk to other people about it. But managing your people is your biggest kind of risk mitigation. Have them trained. Now, one of the, this is one of our barriers as a programme is how do we train a uh, dispersed workforce who have very little time and very little access to anything. And we've actually created an, a free e-learning resource. It's a really straightforward 20 minute course over four modules. That once your staff have all been through that, you can be confident that they've got the information they need to understand data and cybersecurity for what they do in their context, which was the most important part. And then it is about it being on the agenda. So. We talk all the time around like a cultural shift to everyone understanding their role in data cybersecurity. And when we call it cyber, it does put people off. But if I go back 10 years to the conversations we were having around safeguarding and everyone understanding their role in it and what they did if they were worried, there was a real seismic shift where people suddenly started to realise that whether they worked in the office or whether they were the gardener or whether they were delivering to care homes, that they had a role to play in safeguarding. We're in that same place right now with cybersecurity. If you touch any sort of system, you need to know what you're looking for. You know, how do you spot a, a, a scam? And also, what are the things you need to be doing around like password management and keeping up things updated and patched to make sure that you're keeping the device and the systems that you use as safe as possible within your role? And these are really simple things for you to be doing and communicating with your team, enabling your managers to know that it's part of the conversation that they should be having around the breadth of the person's role. 
And you mentioned those, those resources that, that you have um, available for sort of training teams and stuff. Are they, um, it'd be great if, if, uh, if it's possible, we'll, we'll be sharing a link to, to all of this afterwards who, who's attended. Um, were, they, were those sort of free resources that help people from the, from the start understand oh. the premise and how to... So the Digital Care Hub website has, and I don't exaggerate, everything you need on this. Amazing. It's got everything you need around the DSBT. It's got access to this e-learning tool. People can literally fill it out, like kind of complete it via our website. If you're an organisation with something like a learning management system, we've provided the SCORM files free of charge, and we'll be able to provide all the links to be sent around to people after this. Perfect. So I've just put a link in the chat here as well for the Digital Care Hub. But yeah, we will send round um, after this and, and obviously add it to the resources tab in Flock. Um, so thank you. I think I think that that, that is very reassuring um, for, for people watching to know that it's this sort of quite, it can feel quite existential when you hear about cybersecurity and threats and that kind of thing. But firstly, that there is a level where it's stuff that you're aware of already to do with your own life. Like you wouldn't, you know, for your bank, you wouldn't mm -hmm. exactly use the password bank. Um, and also that sort of there are resources out there that you don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to training your team and updating them. Um, that's very, that's very helpful. <laughs> uh, I think the, the, um, with sort of home care and, and domiciliary care, um, a lot of people use remote devices. So they might use their phones to sort of um, log in and out of uh, clients' homes. Uh, they might be um, out and about driving and updating care plans remotely, uh, that sort of thing. So is there any is there anything, any steps that would be able to be taken to secure the network and devices for that kind of remote working? Like, what would you recommend for, for that situation? So without getting into anything too technical, I would, you know, most of the systems that you use, so whatever software you've purchased, will be designed to be used remotely by um, devices. The thing we have in home care and domiciliary care is an unusually high proportion of people using their own devices. And that really comes down to you having good policies and processes in place, making sure that your policy takes care of things like um, deletion upon exit of service, that you, you know, you're putting something in there around people's obligation to update their software, because we all know you put off updating the software for as long as possible. But those software updates contain security patches that are important. And what you need to be doing is ensuring that you've got something in there that obligates your staff to do that if they're accessing your systems. That, again, we go back to password management, that people are using that, that way it's available depending on the software. You've got multi-factor authentication. We all hate the text message with the number, but it is one of the most robust ways of securing a system that you're using um, on a remote device so all of these things are relatively straightforward um the bring your own device policy for example we've got a template policy on the digital care hub you again we made it so you don't have to reinvent every anything <laughs> that was going to be and my anytime question we come across yeah. something else we've even got an audit tool for your policies to check them and make sure they've got everything you need in them everything's there it's free for you to use Sometimes when you're managing things like people using their own devices, it's thinking about how you use your device. So, for example, a lot of people use WhatsApp for communication. It's an encrypted messenger system. In that respect, it's good. But whenever my um, childminder sends me pictures of, like, everyone's kids, they get downloaded to my phone reel. So one of her requests was that people turn that off. If she's going to send updates about your kids, you turn it off. It's the same thing with you. If you're going to be sending things, even if it is just the details of other staff members, because we're not just talking about the people that we care for as data, it's also other staff's data that's important and should be as protected. Um, you know, making sure that people understand they should have that turned off if they're going to use WhatsApp, that you know how to close things down if there's an issue, that also they know how to report. Sometimes we see something suspicious. You know, if they suddenly go into a software and it doesn't look like it normally looks, or they follow a link in an email and it doesn't look the way it should, what do they do about it? And how do you, you know, make sure that they've got a really simple way of reporting that to, you know, the office or the manager, and that that manager then knows what to do with it? You know, tie up all the little points, and that's what keeps your organisation safe. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, from personal experience of working with with Birdie, where that this kind of security piece is just built into everything we do because we're working with like really, <laughs> really run of people like even, you know, the 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 actual platform aside, which has all of the sort of, you know, certifications, we like to think gold standard for it. But within the company, we do um, there's regular phishing tests. Yeah. For like emails and stuff like that. So I think um what's a just so you can describe like what's a phishing test and sort of how easy is it to sort of implement that into into I mean, the organization? Your, your phishing test is where your IT team fall out with all of your staff. Because <laughs> they will literally send an email that is designed to look like something you would receive, but with something slightly different, and then they get a report of how many people clicked on the link. And it is always astonishingly high. I mean, so then you're in the bad books with IT. IT's in the bad books with you for being tricky. Um, but it's a really good way of giving people like a real life consequence free example mm-hmm. of what that feels like in a workplace setting. And yeah. it's really interesting to see. I think one of the challenges we've got with cyber is even if Centrally in an organisation, we understand its importance. Now, Lucy, you touched on it being an existential threat. I don't think we can underestimate how cyber is an existential threat. It can be the difference between an organisation staying open and closed. And we see, you know, typically when we talk to domiciliary care providers and home care providers, they're two invoices away from a cliff edge. Now, your systems can go down for a long time with cyber. If we think of everything else that's in our business continuity plan, a flood, a fire, you know, um, electricity goes off. We're talking 24 hours to 72 hours is that emergency period. With cyber, some attacks have happened and systems have not been back up for six months. Mm. What are you going to do? Do you know what you're going to do? And have you tested it beforehand? Because I can guarantee you've had a fire drill. You've probably turned the lucky off once or twice to see what happens. And, you know, if you're in a place that's often blighted by flood, you've probably run your, your flood defences. Mm-hmm. Have you run a cyber attack? Have you switched off the system at the wall and said, it's down, what are you doing now? So you can explore your backups. These are all things you can be doing ahead of time. So similar to the pen test, the fission test, to make sure that your organization is ready. And everyone has kind of had that little go, oh God, I don't want that to happen to me in real life. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay attention to this. Yeah, I think having that um well it's just crisis planning, isn't it? You know, I, I think it it's it's just having that folder of hopefully never to be <laughs> hopefully never to be used, but that you know, that sort of like here are all the crisis plans, the things that we do in case of an emergency. And I know that sort of larger organizations tend to have people in place to to sort that or even work with companies to to build that out um but even as a small small business even if you're serving sort of like 10 clients or something i guess knowing what you would do in the case of a cyber attack is is really important and and this is is there anything on the um digital care hub about sort of response in it responding in a cyber attack is there any sort of resources around that so there are some resources we're building a much stronger one at the moment so one of the things our program does is kind of like find those little friction points and try and solve them and we did a piece of work last year with a a partner organization to develop basically a crib sheet a step one through ten here's what you need to do so you've noticed something's gone wrong take these steps it's not released yet but it'll be out in the next couple of months in a really simple format and something that you can brief your staff on and say because there's no point the person in the middle who manages all of the crisis plans has it in their drawer but no one else has ever seen it mm. you need to kind of make these things come alive for people which is where things like the the kind of um deficient email tests and various other exercises you can run really help staff understand how it feels to go through it and make sure they never want to you want their only experience to be the artificial environment that you've held it in yeah ab- absolutely and and the and the the hope that obviously if you've chosen if you've done your best to, to choose specifically like software again that is adheres to 
the highest standards of safety that you shouldn't need to go through it as well. And um, this this is something uh, which which I can do, which is is interesting. I think there's kind of almost two two questions um, in one. So I'm going to I'm going to separate it out. Which is what is what is if you notice something fishy and you suspect a cyber attack has happened, let's say, um, let's say that sort of like all of the data that you put in has been changed mm -hmm. and you don't know who buy or whatever. What is your sort of, what should your immediate action be on, on, on spotting that sort of, um, do you have any legal obligation to raise it? Uh, and, and if so, uh, who to? Yes. One of the, um, when we talk about a data breach, people often think about lost data. So I've lost the pen drive, I've lost the file. But incorrect data is a data breach as well. So that example that you gave there, Lucy, if you were to go on and think, oh, actually, well, we've been doing these folders and this doesn't look right, that's a type of data breach. And you do have an obligation to report data breaches to the ICO. Now, the ICO is interested in what you did to prevent it happening, because you can't always prevent it happening. What you did to get ready for it, and then what action you took. So, you know, if that, for example, is in the context of a software system that you use, you need to get in touch with your supplier and speak to them. Now, your relationship with your software supplier and, you know, obviously being here on Flock and and talking to Bertie, that that relationship you have as a customer with your supplier is really important and it's almost more important for those services that you don't quite understand how they work because they're your biggest supporter and help particularly if you're noticing something like that it's happened not just to you you're not going to be the only person um so you need to obviously do whatever's in your business continuity plan we have a template on the website if you want to start building that out speak to your software supplier. You have a time limit with which to report it to the ICO, but it's also a crime, so you report it to the police. And most areas have what's called a cyber resilience centre. Um, cyber crime accounts for about 50% of all crime, according to statistics last year. It's huge. Um, we often talk about like a cyber incident, it's a case of when, not if. The more you can do in the, those kind of first 24 hours to understand the problem, the better chance you've got of mitigating any really serious impacts. Yeah, I think I think it's the immediate action as opposed mm -hmm. to kind of like, oh, I hope someone else spots this, <laughs> which is an understandable impulse, uh, especially if you feel like you've, you know, you've got enough going on already. But it, but it's your legal responsibility to as soon as possible. And what what are the implications if you don't sort of? Um, if you don't report that, is it is it fines? Is it so the ICO can fine you, but you also have an obligation through CQC, which becomes a regulatory issue. So you know, I don't want to be a fear monger and say you know they're going to come down. It's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's going to do this and that and that. The reason for doing it is because we want to ensure continuous of care. We've embraced technology to improve the care that we provide. But in the worst situation, you want to speak to more people, not fewer. And the nature of our sector, because we are individual businesses largely and mostly SMEs, means that there's a bit of a culture of like just, just hope for the best and don't say anything. So, for example, ransomware attacks are where literally your systems will be, sh you'll be shut out of your system and you'll get a message saying you won't get access again unless you pay X ransom, usually in um, Bitcoin by this date, or we'll delete everything, or worse, we'll exfiltrate it, which means we'll take it all out and we'll sell it on the black on the dark web. Now, think about the kinds of data that we hold. We hold financial data. We hold things like people's door codes in dom care and home care. <coughs> so <clears throat> there is a temptation to think, well, if I pay it, then I'll I'll, I'll solve that problem. Paying that ransomware is one of the worst things you can do because it does two things. One, it tells them that you'll pay. And two, there's no guarantee you'll get access back. Anecdotally, I know of people who've paid the ransom never to be seen again, and their data's still been exfiltrated and still been sold. So speak to channels, speak to your software supplier, speak to the police, speak to um, 
CQC and the ICO. You can also, because obviously a lot of you will have the DSPT, report an incident via the DSPT, we then be able to identify, is it happening in the NHS? Because very often it's happening in more than one place. Yeah, I think that that, that leads to that sort of like something you said earlier on the call, which is kind of like it's, you can do everything right <laughs> in terms of getting the right people in that kind of thing. But these things are moving quickly and, and they get, you know, sophisticated and that kind of thing. So the best thing you can do is not hide and hide it and be kind of like, oh, whoopsie. <laughs> like it's 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 the key thing is you have to report it and you can reach out to these different like yeah. channel software provider CQC and go, this has happened. What should I do? And that's the best way to, yes. to jump on it. And and the and the best way to get through that process is to be prepared to have your DSPT to make sure that it, the DSPT has not just been an exercise in ticks, box, box ticking, but actually you've implemented the things that are in there, that your staff understand the policies, that your staff are trained, that report and routes through your organisation have been tested. All of this means that if the worst happens and you find yourself in front of the ICO, you can quite clearly say, well, I did all of these things, and they'll say, okay, thank you. You know, we'll record this within our data, but it was unavoidable. Mm. Mm. it's it's a, a lot of it, it it's very reminiscent of other sort of cqc things but it's how you respond it's how you've prepared and it's how you've responded it's not necessarily the 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 thing itself as well which is 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 a uh, in the nature of the industry that that we're in like you you yeah. things happen <laughs> but you can't you can't mitigate away possible. risk you can't you yeah. can't risk is always going to exist what you can do is lower that level or lower yeah. the likelihood of it tra- happening and lower the impact of when it does happen and that's what you're trying to do all the time the challenge we've got with cyber risk is it just feels so much bigger than us sometimes like i understand that the physical things i've put in place to mitigate the impact of for example if we had a fire like i know that i see the fire extinguishers i know that the fire doors are going to keep people safe i've got the evacuation plans to make sure i can get people downstairs and out the front door I, I can having those things in place makes me feel more secure because that they have that level of familiarity. When we start talking about cyber and backups and the cloud and you know pen testing and phishing and all of these words that are not part of our everyday vocabulary, human nature is to go well. That's not my thing, then, is it? So. Mm. Actually, the more we just take the bull by the horns and say, here's the things I can do and follow it step by step by step by step. Talk to people about it because everyone's in the same boat. Then we're just in a better place. It's not some big scary thing. It does have the air of like a boogeyman. Um, Most cyber criminals are 15 year old teenagers. (laughs) They're incredibly sophisticated and terrifying 15 year old teenagers. But like they're, they're, it's a really young profile, and as technology is developing, um, you know, we've gone half an hour through this conversation without talking about AI. But AI is making things faster and easier to adopt. Just increases the prevalence, so the likelihood is going up. So we need to make sure that what we're doing in terms of risk management is bringing down that impact. And they're all the things that we can support you with. Nice. Yeah, I, I think this key, the for me, one of the key things I'm taking is that it grabbing the bull by the horns is a great way to to put it, where you, you can't just sort of put it off because these are words that are not familiar and, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's for up digital securities for other people, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. There's lots of resources on the digital care hub to break this down, essentially, so that anyone at any level within their business can can get to grips with it and can feel a bit more confident. I think that, that that's uh, that's good. And we will share, um, for, those of us who, for those of us who are joining or watching the, on the recording, we'll share links to the Digital Care Hub as well as any resources that we have on the flock um, or, or Birdie side for, for kind of um, peace of mind <laughs> around this. Uh, so so one, moving on to, the, to, the, to that sort of technology bit, because obviously, working with the cloud, a lot of stuff in the cloud, like it kind of needs to be in the cloud, right? Mm-hmm. In order for us to share information with whether it's GPs or local authorities or um, clients and their families, that kind of thing. It it needs to, everything needs to exist in this space. Um, 
what what is the responsibility of you as the kind of person using this software and buying it and working there so we've kind of covered it in terms of being prepared and, and having tinty fans and then what is the actual sort of responsibility of the provider and um, the software provider to to make sure you're safe like where where does that where generally does that sort of legal responsibility lie it's a really difficult the nature of data ownership is that you as an organization who collects that data and provides the service is the data controller your software supplier becomes a data processor legally the burden is on the data controller so even if you are outsourcing all of the holding of data to a software supplier you're still responsible for making sure that that data is kept safely and securely used appropriately now this is where and we've touched on it earlier lucy is that your relationship with your supplier with your software supplier is so important because there's a, there's got to be an element of trust there but there's also got to be an element of forethought and one of the things we found in doing this work is that very often cyber wasn't in the contract at all there was nothing in there really about the response to a cyber incident which means that should a big software supplier go down they can just shut up shop send in the lawyers and say it's not ours we're taking our ball home sorry if you've got things in your contract and there are things again on the website that can give you you know a, a template contract and that sort of thing that just set out the responsibilities according to your relationship in the incidence of this happening that saves an awful lot of heartache later on and i do say heartache because when these things happen and they go really horribly wrong all of us are just trying to do our best and, and deliver care and when some of our tools are taken away from us, whether it's our staff or our catering or our system, then that care becomes more difficult to do. That that's that's a really interesting a point around sort of like at that at that contract stage, you know, make sure that there's stuff baked into there um, to to do it. And I and I know that sort of um, for for. For Birdie, I know that um, because we're that slightly newer organisation, that's almost been purpose built in the age of <laughs> cyber needing robust cyber security, that those kind of things are just as standard in place. But I know with um, with a lot of sort of providers that I've spoken to and worked with that I've been lucky to, to do sort of through Flock and and, um, and Birdie is, is that sometimes with the older like much older systems or even people using spreadsheets, stuff like that, it isn't quite baked in as much. But mm -hmm. do you think that there's potential to, because this is such an issue, if you're working with an existing software provider that you're that you're happy with and you want to stick with them because you're like, we know the system, it works for us, but you have concerns around the data security, what questions would you bring to that software provider if you know they're a bit older and they're a little bit shaky and they're not as upfront about about the security what questions would you ask them i would have i'd have very few concerns and I, I would like to reassure people i'd have very few concerns that any software supplier doesn't have really up-to-date cyber security because that's good business sense the thing that you really want to bottom out with them is if even despite that something happens what are you going to do for me? Like, if you lose my data completely, what happens? If you have my data but it gets um, contaminated or you know, things that are incorrect, what are you going to do? What is the notification? Like, are you going to come and tell me? Because with some of those organisations who are less scrupulous than, for example, um, Beardy, They've not even told their customers when they've had an incident. People have heard it via the news. People have heard it via someone else who's heard it. You know, so these are conversations and you're going to have contract management meetings during the terms of your contract. You're always working really towards your next contract and they are always got their eye on the next time you sign the dotted line. The sooner you start to ask the questions 
and set an expectation, then the closer you get to that next contract where you expect it to be in there, they ultimately want to keep your business. So, you know, where it's not there, often, I mean, I'm a big believer in don't look for conspiracy when incompetence will do. Very often it's not in there because they've not thought about it, because it's not happened yet. And cyber's the perfect breeding ground for, we've not come across it, so we're not worried. So this would be my advice would be just have the conversation. Next time you speak to them, you know, don't don't go kind of looking for them specifically, but you're gonna have conversations with them. Just ask the question. Yeah, I think it's it's um because yeah, I think most people have regular check-ins with their with you know, especially if it's something so crucial as you know, care management or rostering or finance kind of thing, there's likely to be regular check-ins or at least people you can speak to. So the when you have that touch point with whoever the software provider is whether it is catering as well or or, or that kind of thing or equipment um you're saying it doesn't it doesn't merit its own sort of like i need a session with you on this but maybe just asking what materials do you have around your digital security practices is that a good question to, to yeah. ask yeah i mean far be it for me to tell you how to have your interactions with your, your suppliers if you want if you're worried enough about it then have an dedicated session my experience has been that software suppliers as anyone is are very like sensitive about their vulnerabilities you know they most software suppliers are just trying to do a good job for you so again this is an area in which you want them on your side you want them to work with you on this and an adversarial we've got to have a chat about cyber might not be the best way to do that in terms of relationship um it might work for some and far be it for me to say but they will have some of these answers already and some of them they won't have thought of the questions yet so i'll just drop it in i would say i've been to this thing and i've heard about this i've been considering i've seen more news you know this week we've had a huge attack on the nhs it's on everybody's mind Yeah, I think that 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 in itself is um, just checking. I'm still here because I know my internet's going in and out a little bit. <laughs> Very existential question: Am I still here? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I think in that almost just make bringing it into into the conversation in that casual way, in that sort of like thing, also will help you and your team understand the the day to day low-lying importance of it rather than making it a big panicking issue that suddenly everyone has to jump on and, and change everything it's just creating that culture that ongoing culture of sort of yeah we check in we check in we make sure we're okay we're covered and then we carry on with the important work of delivering care so like ongoing calm looking into it as opposed to cri- <laughs> crisis yeah, let's not, that's like, the set best. alarm bells and we're on we're on cyber watch like none of that is helpful it doesn't help your staff because it becomes another thing for them to worry about it doesn't help your managers because they've just got another thing to prioritize in a list of priorities and it doesn't always help your relationships but it's something that goes in the mix like really my job will be done when people just think about cyber the same way they think about all the other things on the list i'm not having to introduce it to people for the first time but nor am i having to tell them that it's important and they should be taking notice of it and if you can start to incorporate it into your business plan and into your thoughts about finances, into your operations, then it just becomes business as usual and it becomes easier for everyone to get on with their part. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think this business as usual is a great way of thinking of uh, <laughs> cybersecurity for sure. Um, the... Uh, there was there was a, a question that ca- that came up in the in the chat actually. So uh, it came from Sean, which was sort of how do smaller businesses afford security systems? So the the follow up was is there recommended percent of inve- revenue they should be investing in security systems? What what are your thoughts on that? Like, should this are the systems separate to the software that you're already using, or should they be built in? Um, is a system def- different to a software? Like, what, what are your thoughts yep. on that? You, you could spend bajillions of pounds on this and be no better off. For me, in terms of smaller organisations, you are better 
invest then in the controllable hygiene measures that you can. So invest in your staff training, in making sure your policies and everything are updated. And then, as I say, the relationships you have with your existing suppliers. If you are looking to invest in something that is cyber specific, whether it be, you know, pen testing, whether it be someone who's doing kind of um, security alerts for you, for the needs of most small social care enterprises, your traditional IT supplier is probably going to be able to provide some of that at relatively low cost. When for some of the bigger kind of more complex organizations, they have whole cyber departments and that's that's right for them because they're dealing with so many um, risk vectors, so many points of access that they need to have someone watching that big picture. But for a small organization, I would say your best investment really is in the things that you can control. There isn't really a benchmark percentage, I would say. But one thing I would do say is when you're talking to your board, when you're talking to key decision makers, remember cyber is a business risk, not a digital risk. When you lump cyber in with the conversation around digital investments, you're muddy in the waters because when you're talking about digital investments, really what you're talking about is driving efficiencies to increase revenue. You're making more space in your budget because you're investing in this because the return is going to either be, you know, you can take on more clients, you can work faster, people can do more, you can get a staff member to go further. That investment has a bottom line kind of implication. When you're talking about cyber, it is a cost that will never gain you more revenue, but what it will do is protect your revenue. You don't put your fire alarms in because you think keeping people alive in a fire is going to make you more money. You put your fire alarms in because you'd never want anyone to be at that risk. Your cyber measures are the same. So I would argue for a small organization, the biggest thing you can do is get your head around any money you do spend on this is not about the same investment you make in your digital products. It's not about your technology adoption. It's not about your IT. It's about business risk and financials. And if you're in a position where you're trying to convince the board that it's important um, and it's something I speak to a lot of people about where, you know, they've kind of got the picture, but they've gone to their board and the board are like, well, we don't want to spend this money because it's not going to make us any more money. Yes, but it might save your organisation. I, I love it. Yeah. And, and I can see some people in the chat agreeing with that sentiment that uh it's not a it's not a uh, digital risk it's a business risk <laughs> if you have poor poor cyber security i think that it is for there are so many sort of different generations working within social care especially sort of home care don't care where we are people who've kind of been working in it for oh there's my dog kicking up in the background <laughs> people who've been working in it for sort of you know 40 years and sort of have done it all the same way and, and people who are you know just starting their own businesses at 22 because they're excited about it and I think that the breadth of sort of it doesn't matter what age you are you can have a, a you know the the best understanding in, in in multiple areas but just that basic line of like cyber security and the importance of it it is not just an online thing it's business it is core to the business yeah i think that's a really really good um good point um especially for smaller businesses when it looks to what are you prioritizing uh i had um a question that came through which was sort of are there um are there any sort of specific certifications or um sort of standards within healthcare and dom care that that need to be a acquired as a business so obviously you know you need to be cqc registered but is there an equivalent thing for cyber security that you need to have or are they all sort of optional now you're going to talk about my favorite thing lucy which is the dspt the data security protection toolkit it's a snazzy title um but essentially it's the nhs's benchmark for data and cyber security it is the thing that all of the nhs have to be if you're nhs you have to have the dsbt publication to operate because it says i've got these things in place there is now a specific social care version um where the questions are specific to social care there's 42 questions the thing that i always say is Whilst what you're aiming for is publication, the thing itself is a toolkit. 
And my entire program is built around getting people through that toolkit. We are one of the rare times when the Department of Health has really heavily invested in what is a phenomenally well-resourced tactical program to provide free support directly to suppliers to get them through it. So the DSPT, for those of you who don't know, will basically take you through 42 questions across four categories broadly, you know, workforce and training systems, policies, all of the things you've got to have. When you get to a question, you go, oh, I haven't got that. Right next door is a little link with some guidance, which if you click through, will then take you to our website and everything will be there from a video on how to answer the question to the resources that you need to fill in and adapt to access to our helpline. And even better, we've got 28 what we call local support organisations who work in every single local authority across the country who can hold your hand through the DSPT. Now, it's a really good benchmark of you've got a grip on this and you understand it. But if all you do is complete it, it's worthless. What you really need to do is make sure that you're adopting it and embedding it. And all of it is stuff of the type of thing that you need anyway. It is a requirement for any NHS contract. Local authorities increasingly have it in their contracts. And CQC have basically just put it in the portal as an item of evidence across, across one of their um, new inquiry lines. So it's really, really strong. There are other things you can do as well. So the DSPT covers both data security and cyber. So your GDPR is in there and everything. Something that's purely cyber is Cyber Essentials Plus. You can buy any, you know, any level of support to get you through Cyber Essentials Plus. There's consultants coming out your ears who will come and help you do that. As I saw 27,000, there's a number of things. But for something that's quick, easy, I'm, I'm lying. First time isn't always quick and easy. Republishing year on year, straightforward, it's a double. But with tons and tons of support is the DSPT. And it enables you to evidence not just the CQC and your commissioners, but also to insurance companies that you've got things in place to tackle cyber. The, uh, I, I genuinely believe you when you say it's one of your favourite things because the passion in your voice talking about the DSPT. If, if, there's, if there's one kind of thing you want people to, to, to do then sort of this is obviously, you know, go to the Digital Care Hub, but check out the DSPT if you haven't already. Would you see that? Mm -hmm. Just say that yeah, to your... because it covers because you don't need to be an expert is the thing. And this is what I love. It takes you through step by step. Have you got this? And you go, mm, no. So you look at it and you go, okay, well, here's how I get it. And then here's what I do with it. Or you get to it and you say, oh, like, I don't even understand where I'd start with that. Okay, so you click a bit further through, pick up a phone and someone will tell you. And by the time you get through it, you're like, oh, now you've got this whole picture of all these things are taken care of. And I don't have to worry about it again for 12 months. It's done. And when someone, when the worst happens... Someone comes to you and says, well, what have you done? You say, look, I did all, I did these 42 things. I had all of this covered and it still happened. And you go, well, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Like, that's really unfortunate. As opposed to, you didn't do any of the 42 things. And they go, well, why didn't you do that? And why didn't you do that? And you should have done that. You've already been through it all. So, yeah, I'm a big advocate of the DSPT. <laughs> nice. No, I, I, and I, I think um, there's a question that's just come in from John here, which is, uh, are Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus required anymore, especially if you've done the, the DSPT? Some local authorities will still ask for Cyber Essentials Plus because they haven't caught up or they haven't spoken to me yet. Um, Cyber Essentials Plus specifically does a slightly different job. So Cyber Essentials Plus, if you've got that, you can just superimpose it onto the DSPT. And the DSPT will just ask you a few more questions around just data and GDPR. Cyber Essentials Plus is a very binary, you've got it or you haven't. Where the DSPT is different is you can, there are three levels of publication. There are standards met, which is what you want. There's also standards exceeded, which tends to be those people with Cyber Essentials Plus. And, but there's also approaching standards. So if you're an organisation who doesn't have... Um, quite everything in place yet you can qualify for approaching standards and it just asks you to create an action plan which again if you get to and you're stuck you can come to our program and someone will help you with that action plan and take you through implementing it um 
they do slightly different jobs, but the DSPT is the one that you need to access systems in partnership with the NHS. So things like a shared care record would re require um, DSPT, GP Connect, EMAR systems, NHS Mail, all of those, the requirement is the SBT, not Cyber Essentials. I hope that answers um, your question. <laughs> uh, do, yeah, do, do let us know if that if I answer your question, John. I think, um, so I, I know that with, um, so Birdie is um, in Cyber Essentials Plus and exceeds the NHS sort of data security protection toolkit standards, which I think is why we're, we're sort of recommended supplier on that. On that front, there's there's also the ISO two seven zero zero one. Do you do you know what that is as a qualification? And is that just relevant for how is that relevant for for um, sort of someone looking for a software provider? So I would be looking for it in my software supplier. You wouldn't necessarily need it as a small domiciliary care provider, but I absolutely would expect someone who is a software supplier to have it mm -hmm. um, because it is very much around the technical controls. So the person who's got their hands on the the tech themselves, you want them to have it. You probably don't need it. Great, great. Um, well, yeah, for anyone watching, we've got it. <laughs> so, so don't worry. Um, I, I think, oh, yes, so, so the question was, was, was answered, yeah. No, no, no problem, John. So I think as we're, we're heading into the last sort of four minutes or, or so, um, I think the, the key takeaways that I've got here, and as I said, this, 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 this chat has been really good and I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we'll be sharing the, the recording in the resource library and flock, as well as any of the things that um, Michelle has mentioned around sort of the digital care hub um, linked to the, to the DSPT um, and sort of any anything else from, from our side that we can share around this. If there's one thing that someone could do today to to check that their that their system is sort of robust is is there one sort of action someone can can do right now to to kickstart that process go and check your dspt status have you got it or not because you know i mean it's certainly if you're say a franchise or one site of a larger provider go and find out and if you've got dspt status but you've never seen anything and you don't really understand it then Go ask the people who are responsible what that means, because as I say, it is a collection of kind of 42 questions that are 42 things that come out of it, which collectively make you data and cyber secure. Um, the other thing is talk to your staff, show them what, what you mean, like talk to them about phishing. About fishing with a with a PH. Fishing with a PH. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, like if you're really into bass and trout, like talk to them about that as well. It's good yeah. staff management. But, you know, make them aware that this is part of their job yeah yeah and and again business risk not digital risk it's not Absolutely. a yeah. separate thing um so yeah I, I think with with that uh in mind there's 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 lots of really really great takeaways there and what's really reassuring is it's it's not scary it's it's possible to deal with something if you just break it down and the DSPT is a great place to start um, with that. And I think even if you've, you've done it before, as you, as you said, is, is about a year in every in, year. Yep. About a year. So if, if it's been about a year since you've last done it, go back. If you haven't done it, what are you doing? Get over there. <laughs> um, but I think that's uh, we we're going to kind of, end our conversation here i just want to say thank you so much um michelle for for joining us here uh, on flock for this for this chat um it's a big subject but you you've broken it down in a way which i think everyone everyone can um, can hopefully understand great well thank you for having me and everyone good luck and enjoy the dsbt you only get to do it once a year <laughs> Oh, what a treat. Right. Go on, everyone. Go and uh, go and start your DSPCs and um, we'll, we'll catch up with you soon uh, again on, on vlog. Cheers. Bye. Bye.